Hello, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Hope and Healing Center. I'm Beth Woodman, I'm the program director here. Thanks so much for turning out today. Our um, speaker today is Sally Davis, and she's gonna speak on worried about your me memory, it may not be dementia. Uh, Sally is with Amazing Place. She's been serving as the health services director for Amazing Place. In this role, she provides health assessments for the participants, medication administration, health education for both Amazing Place staff and participants, and caregiver consultations. Prior to joining Amazing Place, Sally worked as a research nurse at the UT Health School of Nursing Center on Aging. She served as a nurse interventionist on an in-home stroke study for uh, stroke survivors and their spousal caregivers. She has given numerous presentations on a wide variety of older adult topics for both nursing professional and community caregivers. Please welcome Sally. Hey. Good morning, thank you for having your lunch here. I must say they were saying, don't bring a PowerPoint. It's very informal, very interactive, and now we're in an auditorium. <laughs> and I don't have my PowerPoint, but I do have my notes, and I do want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, and I am a nurse, and um, I feel very proud to work at Amazing Place. So the title of my topic today is Worried About Your Memory, It May Not Be Dementia. The other title was um, Relax, It's Not What Your Kids Think. And <laughs> I, I kind of like that title better, but the folks at Amazing Place, the marketing, they thought, no, we just really need to say what it is. But you know what's on all of your minds. <laughs> your kids are always worried about you. So there are handouts with the um, presentation. I advise you to take those home, put them on the refrigerator, and just let your kids look at them. So um, memory lapses, um, you know, anybody north of 50 starts to worry about memory lapses. And I'm here to alleviate your fears that it's completely normal. Um, normal aging has forgetfulness component to it. Our processing slows down, information becomes some of that short term just as insignificant, and we just don't take time to hold a memory with that. So it's completely normal, plus you figure after 50 years, we have a lot of information running around, and we have different places to store that. So um, I'm just here to alleviate that. Um, it's perfectly normal. So the, the piece of the brain that is responsible for our memories is called the hippocampus. Have any of you heard of that before? Okay, so the hippocampus, I know I can't move because I'm being, okay. So the hippocampus is deep inside our brains, okay? And we have a right side and a left side. And the more developed that is with memories, the more memories you can pull from. And the more you put memories with a sensory or with a tactile touch or an auditory, those memories are ingrained longer. Does that make sense? So think about those of you who, you know, grew up cooking with your parent. Those memories in the kitchen, those are profound. They're, they're there. For me, it's suntan lotion. Every time I smell suntan lotion, it puts me back to memories of camp, sailing, you know, being on the lake. So those memories are locked in. So when you're making new memories or forming new memories, try to put some kind of sensory with them. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about that? And we'll make this as interactive as possible. So, so the, memories, um, the memory has three components. And I want, I'm going over this because I want you to appreciate how we can get so distracted and not remember and the short-term memories go. You have sensory memory, which is what I talked about, the touching, the feeling, and the hearing. And then you have the short-term memory, which are the um, working memory. That is less than a less than a minute you have to work on that and when you're in school and you're studying you're really trying to get that short-term memory into the long-term memory um, so that's why we have those other memories the long-term memories can so um, consist of what we have procedural memory those are those things like driving a car at amazing place where i work we encounter people who can't remember what they had for breakfast but they can drive a car and they can drive a car because they 
That's procedural memory. It's ingrained. It's there. They can still remember how to put on their pants, dress themselves, bathe themselves, but they still can't remember what they had for breakfast. That's that short-term memory that didn't get locked in. And they're either too distracted or they're not able to make those memories. So Procedural go much later. And there are folks, uh, back to the driving analogy, where they just, they may know how to start the car, drive the car, and then all of a sudden orientation kicks in and they don't know where they are. So that would be part of that. And yes, it does, that does eventually fade. But that's why you also have folks that have that great long-term memory. Again, those memories are ingrained, but they, those, are, those fade later. So that's the procedural memory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if there was a significant event, sure, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. So, and you think of your brain as a, I was at a conference one time and they had an analogy of a file cabinet. Okay, so, you know, those of us that are older, our file cabinet's pretty full. And with dementia, the file cabinet becomes, you, you start at the top and then those memories fade from the top and they go to the bottom. So the bottom's filled with like your childhood memories, then your high school, college, early marriage, job, and on and on. And so it just fades that way. And um, a trick about memory is if we put some kind of um, event with it, like say you can't remember, like you see your neighbor's face, but you're like, oh, I can't remember their son's name. <laughs> but you know, all of us have file cabinets. You know, well, let's, we gotta find that folder that's gonna help me pull out that person's name. So that's why sometimes those things come to us late, later. Oh, I remember their name, but you have to go to that file within your brain to find that. And it, as we get older, it just takes longer to do that. That's right. <laughs> well, that's a good point. I, you know, it's so funny. I have to ask on my assessments, you know, do you want, do you, does your loved one have, are they wondering? <laughs> Has there been any wondering behavior? And it's not that our folks sick out to wonder <laughs> and get lost. They get lost because they can't find their way home. And so they just, for what may be a trip to the store, they may end up in, you know, Pasadena because they just can't find their way home and suddenly they're wondering. So but you're right. I think you take the keys away. <laughs> You take the keys away. <laughs> yes. No, I, actually my talk is really about folks with normal aging changes, but I will get into a few signs of when you should get worried. So I, I'm kind of, right now I'm gonna go over eight, eight common causes, and they're all on your sheet of memory lapses. Okay, these are eight common causes. So that's what we're gonna talk about now. And so the big one is stress. Please learn how to manage your stress. Even today, start learning how to manage your stress. Stress is not your friend. It, when we are stressed, we are releasing a chemical in our brain called cortisol. And that's a good thing if there's a fire or if there's some intruder or if you've been in an accident because you want to get out of that situation, that's good. But when you are continually releasing stress, you are changing the neurochemistry of your brain. And it will make, it'll make it harder for you to retain a memory or the neuron, just the structure just may not be there to even re receive that memory. Because in order to make a memory, you have to code it, store it, and be able to pull it back out again. That's an interactive process. So anywhere along that lines, if you're stressed continually, you're not able to process and able to store memories. So stress is huge. I don't suppose there's any medication that helps my memory from the stress. <laughs> any medication to help your... <laughs> 
there's medication to help with stress <laughs> if you are, um, you know, some of our anti-anxiety. But the, I would recommend trying the non-pharmacological approaches with look at your life and what you can remove, remove. I know as we get older, we do have more stresses. We have more physical stress. We may have more loss. Um, so it gets harder, but stress is so important. At Amazing Place every afternoon, because with our folks, stress elevates as the day goes on. We have, we have a relaxation class every day at three o'clock. We bring everybody in, we listen to music, dim the lights, and we go through a really um, low impact um, exercise. So um, stress reduction is very good. Um, so please know that about stress. The one thing else I'm gonna say about stress is multitasking. Our brains hate multitasking. And our poor children, what are they going to do? <laughs> They're not going to have a brain. <laughs> I, I've come to the conclusion, you know, this current generation, they're running around taking photos everywhere they go, right? Their whole life is now chronologically on photo. It's digital. And I've come to realize there's a reason for that because they're not going to have, they're multitasking so much, they're not even able to code all those memories that are going in. So they're going to be able to just, when you know, pull up their phones and show their kids, well, this is what I did every day. You know, they don't even have those memories, but um, I'm convinced of that. So multitasking is not good at any age. Um, I have a friend who, um, she regularly gives me um, stories for my talks. Just this other day, she was leaving Austin, got on her phone, was talking about a very serious conversation. Think she's headed to Houston. She wound up in San Antonio. And she's 50, and she was a little worried, but I told her she needed to, you know, stop. You know, it was just too much going on for her. So multitasking is not good for us. Our brain wants to st start a topic and finish. So tell your children just to, you know, keep all their questions at bay and let you finish your story. <laughs> mm hmm <laughs> well, women are hu horrible about that, and and it's and it takes it even at work. It takes me. I mean, I have people coming in that can interrupt if I'm trying to prepare a presentation or if I'm trying to write a report. I have people coming in and interrupting, and it it does take a lot of focus to stay on topic. Um, I will say mornings are better for us. Um, we tend to have more um, speed in the mornings, so mornings are better, but. Multitasking is very, very tough. Another um, um, cause for memory lapses can be too many medications. The average number of medications people take per day is 12. So count your blessings if you're under that. Medications, yes. Yes, and your, and your supplements, and your herbs, and all that. So too many medications, and um, that really can cause, if you think about it, you have all these medications, and they can really be changing the neurochemistry in your brain as well. So they, they can be counterintuitive. You gotta worry about the adverse reactions and all that. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I just know that it's really contraindicated in some folks, but other than how it works with, we have a lot of folks on Lipitor, which is a, I mean, I see it prescribed as well. My, my best, my soapbox with medications, talk to your pharmacist. <laughs> your pharmacist went to school. That is what their specialty is. And if you have a pharmacist, and they typically are the ones that know your whole medication profile because that's where you go to get your meds, you know, um, administered. So talk to them, have them look at your profile every now and then and say, hey, is there anything on there that, you know, you're thinking maybe might not work? And the other thing is, is a lot of us have different doctors, lots of different doctors, and they may prescribe something and the other doctor doesn't know about it. So I, I'm a real advocate of using our pharmacist because that is... Um, that's kind of the, that's their profession. <coughs> so 
Does print, I'm sure, I know that some do talk about confusion and you should look, you know, um, it, neurologically it can affect, um, it cause dizziness, which could um, aid to that. I, um, I'd have to look at the printouts, but I know that some medications are counterintuitive for folks with dementia, which is why doctors don't like to prescribe them. Sure, or your pharmacist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, then if, yeah, maybe if you go to a certain drug store or a, f a grocery store, there's you know in-house pharmacies there too. Mm -hmm. What's it's so funny, we were just at a talk last week, um, Dr. Carmel Dyer kind of addressed that. And you know, it, it's, o it's okay to take the supplements, but really and truly, if you can get it from your foods, it's so much better. And you know, it's, she was using the analogy, everybody wants to eat organic, but then they take 15 things of supplements. <laughs> Remember that? I thought that was pretty funny, because it's true. You know, we're all into the organic, but yet we're gonna throw back all these pills in our mouths. So it's better to get that um, through our diet. What was the last part of your, the yeah, vitamins? The yeah, the supplements. Oh, the coconut oil. Now the coconut oil, we, I had a gentleman at Amazing Place that I did give coconut oil to three times a day. His wife brought it in a bottle. Have any of you cooked with coconut oil? So it looks like lard, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of shocking the first time I bought it. I thought I was going to find it like an oil. <laughs> But she would, I guess she melted it down and she'd bring it in vials for me to give. And the, the, the theory of the coconut oil is it can act like a sugar and help transport. If, if, the, if they're, say the plaques and tangles associated with even Alzheimer's, if they're in the way, it might be a way t for another transport to make that um, connection. So it has some validity, um, it, it can't hurt. Um, I cook with coconut oil. I saute all my veggies in coconut oil. I don't know about that, uh, but I use coconut oil as a moisturizer. Yeah, I've heard that too. Well, it certainly looks like it can hurt. You can absorb things through your skin for sure. Yeah, and it's a lot cheaper. And it's a lot cheaper. <laughs> yeah. Are there other things that you know Yeah, I'm going to go over some protective uh, measures and food. Diet is huge. I mean, we ca I can talk about that now, but diet is very huge with protecting yourself against um, dementia. Could I ask you about the incobal bladder? Yeah, the incobal, um, I don't know a lot about that. I don't. You've seen a lot about that? Isn't that the depression? No, no, I don't. It's not the, okay. Um, okay, speak up, okay. Um, okay, so as far as m medications, if you're noticing your loved one having some more memory lapses, the bottom line is find out if there's been a new medication added because that could be the culprit and that's easily taken care of. So medications. Another um, cause for memory lapse can be depression. And as we get older, unfortunately, you know, we can get, we can get more depressed. I mean, we, again, we have losses, we have changes in our abilities, et cetera. Um, and why this happens is we have serotonin that suddenly, it's a neurotransmitter in the brain that suddenly is less. So truly, the, again, if you're distracted, depressed, and you, you might not be able to form that new memory. So then you're walking around wondering, why did I come into the room? You know, how many of you had that feeling? Why did I come in the room and I can't remember what I needed to be? Well, if you're, if you're depressed and you're not able to really process what you either heard or what you're supposed to be doing, um, it won't work. So focusing too much on sad events can cause to that change as well. Um, so it just affects our concentration. So depression needs to be looked at. It's easily treated nowadays. There are some really good antidepressants um, on the market that help even older adults. Um, when I first got out of nursing school, we were doing shock treatment. I don't know if you know ECT? Yeah. yeah. We were doing that on the older adults because there weren't good medications for the older adults, and that's all changed. So there are good meds. So depression can be one of them. Another factor for um, memory lapses is hypothyroidism, thyroid. How many of you are on a thyroid pill, if you don't? <laughs> 
It's like the first thing you, if you have any kind of memory issues, that's like the first thing a doctor can really zero in on. And if you're low in thyroid, you, um, you tend to be, um, that was built in. Okay, now we're back, all right. So hypothyroidism, if you think about your thyroid, and in and, and hypothyroid, everything just slows down. So, you know, you hear something and you just can't take that thought in. So you really, every, you ha the medication helps supplement that and you're able to um, help with your memory. So hypothyroidism is easily, easily detected and easily treated. So that would be baseline. Go get that checked. Yeah, and you know, there's, there's some mental status exams that are easily administered. Um, I just saw one today, it's called the AD8. AD8, y'all can self-administer that. <laughs> Google AD8, and um, I think it's Alzheimer's dementia, and then um, Alzheimer's disease hyphen eight, it's eight symptoms. You can, it tells you eight stories, and you can take that. Oh, she was asking if your GP um, had a way of easily detecting if it's a if it's a sufficient ex um, exam. So if you're at all worried about your memory, you could do the ADA. Hmm. Yes, I highly recommend it. <laughs> you grade your own paper. <laughs> okay, the, another cause for some memory lapses in particularly women is menopause. All right, y'all have heard that, that brain drain that happens, that estrogen goes away, and we need that estrogen to help us with our neurons. We need it for our brain, and that goes away, and, you know, we get real scattered. We can't remember, you know, what... Um, what our children are telling us, and now I know why my mother had children so young. So we, you, you should not be around adolescents when you're going through menopause. I've, I've, it's, it's just not right, because they steal things from you, and they don't, they lie, and then they, then you think you've said, well, I know I just bought that shirt, and I can't find it, and they're telling me it, they don't have it. It should just never happen because then you start questioning yourself. But menopause is real, um, the estrogen is low, and um, it does affect the way we think. So that's a real, real common cause for those memory lapses. Again, another reason to go to your GP or your um, GYN and say, look, this is happening to me. What can we do about it? But that's real. Um, another cause for normal kind of memory lapses is alcohol. Too much alcohol is not good for us as we get older. Um, we process alcohol slower as we get older, so those three drinks you were able to manage on a Friday night when you were 50 or 60, that's gonna stay with you until the next day. So if you start dosing again, you're just adding on. So the alcohol is, um, it just takes us longer to process that. Um, again, I was hearing Dr. Dyer um, speak last week, and her response to the alcohol was, is if you're going to drink, then just have that glass of wine like you would take your medicine, you know, every night at 6 o'clock. Have your drink. You know, and she said about four ounces. But do it like you would prescribe medicine, and that's better for you than to have, as she said, all six in one night. <laughs> so drinking is real, and drinking can really cause long-term memory loss. So um, we see that too. Another, uh huh. Question about, the, um, about menopause. I read something that said protein helps in the production of estrogen, but it said it shouldn't. Oh gosh, I, I, I don't know that. I don't. I'm sorry. I, we, we could we could Google that. <laughs> I don't. I'm sorry. I mean. And I, but I think protein's good in general. So um, I, I just think with the menopause, I think we with the menopause, it's just so easily treated. If you do have those issues, that it'd be easy to get on something for that. Um, another cause for some memory lapses is traumatic brain injury. 
You know, there's a lot of discussion right now about concussions um, and the long-term effect of that, particularly with our football players. And um, it's if you if you are if your loved one suddenly is having some memory changes, just ask them if they've had a fall. Uh, you know, it could be that they had a fall and it's impacted a part of their brain, which is, may have led to swelling or bleeding. And again, you could go get that scanned and found out. So falling is um, a really big risk factor and um, with our older adults, and it, that can cause some memory, memory changes. So definitely find that. Um, so trauma to the brain. So those are some, um, those are seven causes for memory lapse. And the last one I really wanna talk to you about is just what I think I started out with. It's just normal. Um, for, our, for us to become more forgetful as we become older. And um, they're not necessarily a sign of dementia. The normal brain declines in our late 20s and early 30s. I know, when I, get, when I tell that to younger people, I'm like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but that really does happen. Um, and by our 40s and 50s, most people have that, now why did I come into the room feeling, right? Um, you know, the, I, I always tell folks, you know, it, we all have that feeling. We go to the grocery store, we come out, we can't remember where I parked our car, right? If you can't remember the color of your car, that's a problem. <laughs> okay? That's the difference. So just remember that. So just relax. You know, you'll, it will come to you, but it's the color. Now, in my mother's case, what she did, which I thought was very tricky, she just bought the same color every year. <laughs> Which, which I thought was kind of a good strategy, so just do that. Um, the risk of dementia increases with age. It doubles every five years, over 65. I'm sorry. And 50% of our adults, 85, will be affected. So it's coming. It's the, we, I don't know if you've heard in the literature, but they refer to the um, dementia as like the tsunami. It's coming, and we're trying to be prepared for that. But that's that. But again, back to the normal. That's kind of normal. It's normal to be forgetful as we get older. Um, I am going to talk about some protective measures. Um, prim the big one, and again, I was just confirmed listening to Dr. Dyer last week. Exercise. If you don't take one thing away from today, exercise. It is not too late. It is not too late. Exercise is so good for your body. Um, the University of Cambridge just came out with a study. One in three Alzheimer's cases were preventable, and the lack of exercise topped the chart for a risk factor. Because if we exercise, we're going to take care of our hypertension, we're going to take care of our diabetes, and we're going to take care of our stress. So it's really the best. And if we exercise in a group, which is what I do, I got socialization, which is also another protective measure. So if we're going to exercise, be with a group because you're getting that socialization. That's a secondary benefit. So, and you can start at any age. You can just, just 30 minutes a day improves your memory performance, increases your endurance and it, your posture. And as we get older, we want to stand up straight and we don't want to fall. And so it really helps with all of that. Increases your metabolism. That goes back to the thyroid, gets that moving and it decreases your body fat. So um, exercise is big, and again, it can be in any shape or form. At Amazing Place, we have three different types of exercise. We have a group that gets together and they spin um, their arms on, a, on a pedals. They either do it on their arms or their legs. Then we have a group that does a um, stand behind a chair, and they um, do more leg lifts and actually do more standing exercises. Then we have a group that we call sit and be fit. They sit because of maybe physical um, limitations, but they're still moving and marching and talking and doing what they can. We've even um, started a Zuma class. Yeah. We had a very, one of our very cute program <laughs> leaders went out and learned how to Zumba, and I think he already knew how. And oh my gosh, the class was full and everybody was just having fun and w staff was getting involved. It was, it was really good to see. So extra, extra, Zoom is the Latin, moving the hips. 
Okay, so exercise is big. That's a big protective measure. Um, back to the diet. Um, again, quoting Dr. Dyer last week, the DASH diet, which is a heart diet, as well as the Mediterranean diet, those are the best diets to follow. And it's a lot of fish, it's a lot of grains, it's, it's whatever's good for the heart's good for the brain. So just think about your diet in that way. Sugar is, you know, really try to reduce your sugar or get your sugar from your fruits. Um, so the, we, at Amazing Place, we serve the um, memory, um, nutrition, memory Preservation Nutrition Program, which is a combination of the Mediterranean and the DASH. And we serve a lot of fish, like three days a week we have fish or shrimp or some kind of, uh, we even we do meatless dishes as well. So um, eating is huge too. So watch what you eat all the time. Um, and another factor going along with eating is um, water. It's so important to drink water. How many of you have heard that? I bet the ladies have all heard that, right? So as we get older, particularly women, we lose the sensation of thirst. We're just not thirsty. You know, we just lose that. So you have to force yourself to drink that water because water is so important. And it keeps, it just keeps us all working. Um, most of my, all of, I would say 80% of my 911s at Amazing Place have to do with dehydration. Our folks have come in dehydrated and they lose consciousness, their blood pressure goes down, and I have to call 911. And they go to the hospital to get an IV. And it's just hydration. So water is so important. One thing I'm gonna say about water, I know that this can be very intimidating, because what do they tell you to drink? Like four of these a day? You know, six, a lot. An amazing place, we have women that get overwhelmed with that, or, and we just put like little juice glasses. We, we want them to feel successful. So we put like maybe three little juice glasses in front of them instead of the big cup because they, they, it's just overwhelming to some folks to sit down and think they can drink that much. So um, water is so important. Um, now, I will say with the water, when we drink a lot of water, what has to happen? <laughs> yeah, and we don't like to do that either because that can get into a lot of other problems. So um, the best rule of thumb is um, try to cue yourself if you are worried about continence issues. Um, just make it a rule every two hours, no matter where you are, you just go. If you know you're gonna be out running errands, you just, even if you don't have to go, you make yourself go. Put yourself on your own toileting schedule and that will help eliminate some of the fear because you've got to keep drinking. You can't just go all day and not drink. Um, and so you put yourself on a schedule. Where I work at Amazing Place, every time we move activities, there's a hydration and there's an invitation to use the restroom. And that's how it works all day. And everybody's queued up to do that. So just make sure you um, stay hydrated. Another um, protective measure, oh yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. That m yeah. In, listen, we have all kinds of ways people work <laughs> work it out. We have folks wearing the depends with the pads in it. Two depends. I mean, <laughs> however it works. Yeah, and that, that, that goes to our water pills, too. Um, I, I, um, it's better to get up. It's better to get up. But then that leads into my next protective measure, which is sleep. So if it is better to get up, but it's better to get up safely. I think what people get worried about with waking up at night is the falling. Because guess where most of the falls happen? At night. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or you're trying to get there, yeah. <laughs> That's true. So my big thing about the bathrooms are make sure you have them well lit, right? I don't know, how many of you travel with like a little night light when you go visit, visit somewhere? 
my mo- I knew my mom was, she started traveling with a nightlight and I was like, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> but um, no, so you have to make it safe. I mean, I would rather you drink the water, you know, I would say cutting off maybe at seven, you know, but five is early. That's before some dinners. Um, but I think you have to make your um, environment safe at night and get rid of those little pretty um, rugs that you have in the bathrooms, you know, make it as very easy to get in, um, put a hand bar if you need to. Some people that have some balance issues, I just heard this from a caregiver yesterday, um, they, the la- her, his loved one didn't need a walker during the day, but at night she had a really bad fall. So the, the um, I guess it was a physical therapist recommended, put the walker right next to them at night so that even if, even if she doesn't need it during the day, just at night, just to steady yourself, because it's really the best device to steady yourself. You get up, you steady, and then you can move. I thought that was brilliant. I know she told me that if you get up at night, don't get up and stay. Right, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Same idea. Stabilize. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. So she's saying don't get up and just go right away. You know, get steady yourself and allow your, your body to, to wake up to really wake up. But that brings up the next protective measure, which is sleep. It's so important to get good sleep. And I know it eludes us as we get older. Um, It's very hard to get that good sleep. Um, If you were someone that went to bed really early and you're finding yourself waking up at that dreaded 3 or 4 a.m. level time, try to push your bedtime back. You know, try to stay up so that you're not waking up at that 4 o'clock time. Um, and as you get older, you, you really don't need as much sleep, right? Because you're really not doing as much during the day, some of us. So you don't need that, all that sleep that you once did. I will say that for my memory impaired folks, they get tired quicker because it takes a lot more for them to stay focused and present. It takes a lot more energy because they're, they're trying to figure this out and stay stay very socially intact. That takes a lot more memory. So when they leave Amazing Place, oftentimes caregivers will say, oh gosh, they just come home and sleep. And I'm like, yeah, they're tired. You know, it, it's true. It, it's very tiring. Mm-hmm. Well, napping, I have a great slide for napping. I didn't bring it, but um, napping is good. But napping, an hour, I would say, is probably too long. I think if you can do those power naps, 30 minutes, because what you don't want to do is take that time from that long sleep. Because when you sleep, that's when you're processing the day. That's when some of your memories are being stored. You don't know that. That's all happening while you're sleeping. That's why, how many of you at night lay down and say, oh, I remembered the neighbor's boy's name? <laughs> it's because you've, that's what's going on. You know, oh, I remember the name of the movie I'm supposed to go see. Um, that's what's going on. So sleep, the real deep sleep, you really try to get and try to preserve that for a long amount of time. Napping is fine. In fact, my folks that come to the clinic and they want to take a nap, I'm good for 20 minutes. But I, but I don't want them getting into more than that because then I'm taking away time at night from them. But sleeping is so important. So those are some protective measures um, for battling. And, and another, obviously, one is mental stimulation. You know, they're saying take up a language, take up a music instrument, take up a music, um, dance. You know, dance is great because, again, it's that socialization and it's also moving. Um, tr- your body's trying to figure out all the dance steps. Dance is great. Um, socialization's awesome. You know, try to stay socially connected and have a purpose. We did a um, participant survey at Amazing Place, like from our folks and how well they like coming. And it had a wide range of um, questions, but, and they had responses. And one of the requests that our folks want to do is give back civically. They want to do something for another organization. They want to volunteer. So they still, in their dementia, want to have 
purpose. We, we were astounded, just astounded. But they still wanted to give back and um, be part of a volunteer network. So if any of you know of good civic projects, we, I would love to talk to you, for our folks. Um, okay, so I've got 10 minutes, and I'm going to quickly go through... If you're all interested, are you all interested in maybe when it is time to call the doctor about dementia? <laughs> I'm never quite sure if you all want to know that or not. Okay, so I'll run through those real quickly and um, we can do some more Q&A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, again, back to the talk I went to last week with Dr. Dyer, that's probably one of the worst drugs to administer to an older adult. I know. <laughs> I know. She got the same kind of reaction in her talk. It, it's not, it just stays in your system. It's just not a good, one of the better ones. I don't know if it causes that. It's just, as an older adult, you sh should just really cut down on that. It's just the combination of the medication in the Benadryl. Um, what would I suggest? I think some of the prescription medications are okay, but nothing long term with the sleeping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I would consult with your pharmacist. <laughs> they would be a good one to know, but Benadryl is not a good one. Well, that's a good question. So you could do the mid-morning and then anything before the five o'clock, but, but low, but not, not, you know, not a long one. Like I wouldn't lay down at five o'clock and take a big old power nap because you will be up all night. Are you saying about 20 yes, 20 if, You know, I'm very blessed. I'm, I mean, I'm able to sit down and just say, okay, do the power nap. And I, there's some people that can do that. I'm one of them, but some folks you do need to set an alarm. <laughs> you know, to wake yourself up. <laughs> so um, I'm going to quickly go through when you should, you know, maybe do that AD8 that I told you about, because I'm sure most of you don't need to worry about that. Um, so when memory lapses cause fear, if you're suddenly getting into these memory lapses and you're worried that you're having them a little more often than you probably should, when they cause an emotional component, which is typically fear, Sometimes it can be sadness. Sometimes it can be anxiety. But if it's causing an emotional component, you might want to get that checked out. Or if you hear your loved one express that. Or not maybe verbally express it, but non-verbally. I had a, a man today, very, I mean, his wife's 53, and she's looking to come to an amazing place. And what he said was is that he noticed she didn't want to go out anymore. So she was, you know, withdrawing. So if you see an emotional component or feel that, because typically you feel it first, you know, that could be a sign that something's just not right. Um, another way, another memory lapse is when it impacts your work or play. Again, in this woman's situation, she didn't want to go to um, her husband's parties anymore. She just wanted to stay home. She didn't want to get out. So if it's impacting the way you work or play, um, for example, how many of you like sticky notes? <laughs> how many of you have sticky notes all over? <laughs> um, the sticky notes, uh, my favorite is, is when the sticky notes remind you of other sticky notes, you know? <laughs> my father had dementia, and that's when I knew it was getting out of hand, when I walked into his office, and I pretty much saw his brain, because the sticky notes were everywhere, and they were notes to remind you have notes. So the sticky notes, watch out for that. If you're asking for more help, if you hear your loved one asking for more help that they used to be able to do, you know, um, that might be a sign. Those of us that are still working, sending lots of emails. You know, we're just, <laughs> we're sending a lot of emails because we're not sure we sent that email. So there's an email train. Um, and I will say your coworkers, if we're still in the workforce, the coworkers usually detect it before family because they're, they're, they're very aware. 
Um, abandoning hobbies, I will talk about this. We see this a lot at Amazing Place. If you were once very good at a hobby, typically that you won't want to try that anymore because once, if you mastered something and you know you can't do it to your full ability, you'll stay away. So the hobbies all of a sudden become abandoned. They're no longer able to, either they don't want to try them or they just stay away altogether. We see this with our, we have an art program every Tuesday and we always hear families, you know, oh, you know, she was such a great artist, please make sure she goes to the art room. Guess who doesn't want to come to the art room? Same thing with Bible study. Oh, she went to five different Bible studies, please make her go to the one o'clock Bible study. Guess who doesn't want to come to Bible study? So it's that inability to, once you were able to perform, you no longer feel like you can do that. So watch out for the abandoning hobbies. The other thing is um, buying more takeout. If you notice your mother who used to cook is now knows all the Domino's numbers and all the, you know, maybe she's not cooking because she can't, you know, so watch out for that. Um, as I said, the other um, sign can be people start to whisper. And again, coworkers, if you're still working, they tend to find out sooner. Family may start calling you on your goofs. You know, why'd you put the keys in the refrigerator? What do you mean you it's like? It's right there. You know, they start calling you out. And then if you have a reaction to that, whether it's anger, frustration, um, tears, whatever, but um, it's very easy to, um, friends and families will begin to whisper and you get defensive. One of the early signs of dementia um, involves digits. Digits are very difficult um, numbers. In, a, in my father's case, I knew something was going on, not only with the sticky notes, is he always traditionally calculated the tip. In those days, you know, you calculated tips. He couldn't do it anymore. So he would just, it was just a very subtle response, but he just pushed it over to my mom and she suddenly just took that on but he wasn't able to calculate that anymore. So digits are one of the first places to go. <laughs> that, that's a very good question. Um, it I, think, I think if you're seeing it quite a bit or if it's impacting, I, my bottom line is safety. I think you have to look at safety. If they're really having safety issues, and if they're not living with somebody, I mean, because some of our caregivers, our families become what we call, they kind of come be codependent. Like the, the husband maybe know this is kind of going on and they all kind of work it together. I think if they're living alone and you're really concerned about their safety, but certainly if they are living with somebody, you can always bring it up with the loved one, but that's a real, that's a real tough, especially if it's early on. It's hard, that's hard. Right, yeah, you, you, yeah. I mean, it could be you were distracted maybe, you were thinking about something else. A, 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 a way to alleviate that is put your purse in the same place, you know, like your keys. Put everything where you, put. everything should have a spot by now. <laughs> At this point in our lives, everything should have a spot. And that, that's, uh, that's a compensatory mechanism <laughs> for us, but. Um, and then another memory lapse when you notice um, you start to cover for your loved one, that's what I was talking about, like if they can't make the tip, oh honey, anybody would have trouble with that. Or if they're driving and they're not following the road, they're not, if they're going to a familiar place and they're, they got lost, oh, anybody could get lost on these roads. I mean, you start hearing what we call smoothing over statements. And if you're feeling like you're making those a lot, you might wanna have your, um, might think about it being a little more severe as memory loss. And then lastly is choices. Choices become more challenging as we get older. So if someone's having um, dementia, it could be very difficult for them to go into their closet and put an outfit together. Choices become overwhelming. So you might you know, have the black pants and the brown pants and they wear those or Another way they'll be found out is if at a menu, like when they're ordering food, they'll just say, oh, I'll have what you're having tonight. 
instead of really picking from the menu. Because they're having to make choices. Choices involve a, you know, you got to remember what you might want. You got to remember what you had before, if this was good. So, so choices are big. Um, and they become challenging with folks with dementia. So that is, I'm trying, I think that's it. Are there any other questions? We've got about three minutes.